Daddy, what are you doing? We're recording a podcast. Who's listening? Islander fans are listening. Where are they? Well, they're right here. Welcome to the Isles Faithful Podcast with your host, Michael Sherline. All right, welcome back to the Isles Faithful Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Sherline, as always, and this is episode 20. Uh, this episode, I am joined by Down Goes Brown, the gnome de plume for Sean McIndoo of The Athletic and also his own blog by the same name. Sean, how's it going? Hey, going pretty good. So, uh... I didn't really think we would be talking about an Islanders win in Tampa when uh, when we were speaking earlier this weekend, but here we are. Yeah, that was uh, that was impressive. Uh, not too not too many teams are beating the Lightning these days, and that uh, uh, I mean they they didn't just beat them; they they kind of spanked them a little bit there. So that was uh, that that's that's impressive. That's two points that you didn't think you were going to get in the bank, and uh, this time of year that uh, that helps a lot. You know, it's funny, as we were talking earlier this weekend again, um, I, I kind of figured at some point, you know, there would be detractors, which, you know, there tend to, to be when it comes to the New York Islanders, unfortunately. And right off the bat with this win yesterday, oh, well, Tampa just came off of travel and, and three games in four nights and yada, yada, yada. The Islanders are pretty much right there with the, almost the same schedule minus the travel and getting in late. So they they also had tired legs. And regardless, I had kept saying Tampa is the gauntlet for pretty much anybody in the entire league. And if you can go and you could steal two points or outplay them like the Islanders did for large stretches yesterday, you know, that's got to be that's got to say something towards the makeup of the team and what Barry Trotz has been able to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, uh, you know, it, it's. Teams are tired this time of year. I mean, you know, teams teams are tired. Some of them are beat up and hurt. Some of them aren't uh, aren't at their best. And uh, I mean, you can only play the team that the 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 league and the schedule put in front of you. So, I don't think the Islanders owe any apologies for uh, for that one last night. That was that was an impressive game. That's uh, uh, you know that's exactly what you're doing. And it's it's probably at least a little bit demoralizing to some of those teams right around them in the uh, in the wild card race because that was one where you probably looked at the schedule and said, well, I mean, they, they, they'd be lucky to get maybe one point out of that one. They probably won't get two, and, uh, and you know, that'll be a chance for us to write off some of those games in hand that they have. Uh, and instead, they put two points in the bank. That's, uh, you know, that's it was, it was an impressive night, and I don't think you have to put any qualifiers on it. No, and, you know, looking at the schedule again, when I saw that there was a back to back with the Rangers and then Tampa, I didn't think the split would go the way that it did. I thought maybe we would have got points against the Rangers on Saturday and maybe been lucky to sneak away with a point in overtime or a shootout uh, against Tampa. But I'm I'm pleasantly surprised and I'm happy because that's kind of like a statement win when you could, you know, play a team like Tampa and play them like they did and come away with two points. So again, just total surprise there and and. Hopefully they can build upon this and, and just look back and, and know that they can hang with some of the best teams in the league here moving forward. Yep. Right. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about how you landed at the athletic. You know, I know you, you have your own website and, and all that. And then uh, with uh, the popularity gaining of the athletic, it's good to see you land over there. Cause you, you do great stuff. And I, I followed you for quite some time and always liked your stuff as, as much as maybe some of my fellow fans might not agree all the time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my, my path here has been, Sort of a weird and and winding one. I uh, I actually I wanted to be a sports writer growing up as a kid. I I got a journalism degree, uh, and then kind of got out into the real world. And and the the journalism thing wasn't really happening for me. And I ended up getting an offer to go and do a different kind of work. And I did that for for a lot of years. And about uh, ten oh geez more than ten years ago now, uh, ten eleven years back, uh, when blogs kind of really exploded and became a thing. Uh, I, I started a blog mainly just so I'd have an outlet for, for writing. I always loved writing, didn't necessarily love the rest of the, the stuff that goes into being a journalist. Uh, but I did love the writing part and, uh, this, this was a chance to do it. And I figured if, if I could get a few dozen people reading me, that would be cool. 
And uh, it, it took me a while to get up to a few dozen, but eventually that turned into a couple of hundred and, and then uh, and then more than that and, and opened a few doors uh, to do a few different things at uh, uh, different sites and eventually landed at a website called Grantland, uh, which was uh, a fantastic uh, site uh, and a, a fantastic job and uh, spent a couple of years there uh, really enjoying it and uh, learning as much as I could from a, a roster full of ridiculously talented writers all around me. I've, I've said in the past that I, I feel like having been at Grantland for, for a couple of years, I know what it must have felt like to be the fourth line winger on the 79 Canadians because you're just looking around at like this roster full of Hall of Famers around you and you're just sitting there going, geez, I just don't want to embarrass myself and, uh, uh, you know, just, just learn as much as I can. I probably should have said like 83 Islanders instead of 79 Canadians, but uh, <laughs> it's all uh, good. I got it. I got I got to adjust adjust for my audience I guess but uh Grantland uh, closed uh towards the end of 2015 I spent a couple years freelancing and uh at uh, at various different sites and a, as part of that uh I I would get contacted every now and then by uh some company or some site saying would you like to do work for us and and sometimes I I I did and I could and other times it didn't work out and that was fine but one company that contacted me early on was this this little company no one had heard of called The Athletic. And it's it's kind of funny now t- seeing how they've grown over the last couple of years because when they first contacted me back then, they were just a Chicago site. And they kind of said, you know, we, we're just starting. We're just doing Chicago right now. But would you be interested in, in, in you know, maybe doing something with us? And I got to be honest, I, I, I basically blew them off. I basically said, like, yeah, you know what? It, Maybe I would be interested, but uh, why don't you check back when when you've grown a little bit? And, and <laughs> instead, they grew a lot very fast, and and obviously that's that's been a big story in the sports media world. And every now and then they would check back in and say, you know, is there something we could do? And eventually, this this summer, uh, the, this past off season, it 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 became apparent that it just made sense to uh, go over and and kind of have a full time home again. So. Uh, I've been there uh, since the start of the season, and and I've been enjoying it. And again, it's it's kind of. I'm kind of back to being the uh, the the depth piece on the uh, 83 Islanders, but uh, that's that's cool. It's I'm learning a lot, and it's uh, it's been a lot of fun. I'm glad to hear that, and uh, you definitely, like I said, pump out some great stuff in in a way that you know I've grown accustomed to reading, and maybe a lot of people don't really understand that. Like like the exchange the other day uh, when I tagged Mark Parrish in our little Twitter thread there, and and he didn't yes. really realize your your sarcasm because <laughs> I told you he would get quite defensive. <laughs> yeah, no, that uh, yeah, that was that was quite funny because he he was uh, uh, what we were we were talking about Eric Karens and. Uh, uh, the Shane Corson fight from from yes. that uh, two, that brutal 2002 playoff, and and I guess I made a reference to, uh, you know how how awful it was that that Eric Karens had had picked on poor defenseless Shane Corson, yeah, which which is clearly not not what happened, but uh, yeah, Mark uh, uh, saw that, and uh, yeah, I think. Uh, you know, no, normally I'd, I'd like to think if it was face to face, he would uh, he would think, well, this this guy must be making a joke because that was such a stupid thing to say. But it being Twitter, uh, it, you kind of, you know, <laughs> you're on Twitter long enough. You sort of learn to assume that the people who sound stupid might actually be stupid. <laughs> and uh, I don't I, I don't take any offense to him making that assumption for uh, for myself. So we're going to roll right into everything here and a couple of people chirped me to tell you to put on some shin guards and I'm not going to go hard on you because I actually agree with the premise of your article on the athletic last week and you know it's titled are Islander fans right in thinking their team's not getting enough credit and for all intents and purposes there are times where I feel like they don't and there are a lot of times where I feel like the coverage is just right you know especially you know, with all the drama surrounding Josh Hosang and, the, you know, a little bit of news trickling out today, whether it be fact or fiction about some more drama that we wish would just go away. So it's like two steps forward, two steps back. And to me, your article reads almost to the theme of Billy Joel's You Might Be Right, <laughs> if you know the lyrics to that song. Yeah. So I mean, let let me let me back up a little bit on on where this this article even came from because I I have been hearing from Islander fans uh, for pretty much most of the season certainly certainly since they they kind of heated up in November and the uh, you know I do, I do a uh, power rankings every Monday 
But the power rankings I do, it's only a top five and a bottom five. And the Islanders, you know, have have certainly not been in that uh, bottom five conversation like we thought they might be. Uh, but they also haven't been in the in the top five. I think, you know, even the most optimistic Islander fan wouldn't necessarily try to make the case that they're they've been one of the five best teams in the entire NHL. But occasionally I would hear from Islander fans saying, you know, where are the Islanders? How come you're not talking about the Islanders? And, you know, I, I would have to explain, look, this, that's not what this is. This is a top five and bottom five. And then uh, a, a week ago, or I guess two weeks ago now, I wrote a post where I said, uh, let's look back exactly one year ago in the standings and look at where teams were halfway into the 2017-18 season and then look at where they are now and, and let's talk about the teams that have made the biggest jump. And that was teams like uh, Montreal, who have had gone from you know a disastrous season to, to being in the playoff conversation. It was teams like Calgary that had jumped all the way to first place. Colorado had gone from outside the, the playoffs uh, to, to actually making the playoffs. And, and, you know, there are a couple other teams like that. And I, I you know, a, a lot of times in this job, when you write something, you, you have a sense that it's going to tick off a certain fan base or a certain type of fan and, and you're ready for it. And I, I, that post went out and it never occurred to me that I was going to be ticking off Islander fans, but I got flooded with all of these furious Islander fans demanding to know why they weren't mentioned why the Islanders were not mentioned in this article about teams that had made a jump from halfway through the last season to halfway through this season. And and my response was that halfway through last season, the New York Islanders were sitting in the last wild card spot. And halfway through this season, they were sitting in basically the last wild card spot. They hadn't moved a ton of stuff. Obviously it happened in the meantime and they've been up and down and you know, they're, they, we, you know, we all know the off season and, and, and everything like that. Mm. But that based on what the point of the piece was, there was this, this wasn't something where you would you would talk about the Islanders. But I, I mean, I was just getting uh, hammered in the comments, hammered on on Twitter uh, and what have you. And I, I ended up talking to a few other writers and I was like, yeah, what's the deal with Islander fans? And they were like, oh, no, no, this is happening everywhere. Every piece, every power rankings, everything has got Islander fans who are cranky because they're not getting enough attention. And, you know, when I was done, you know, having having a bit of a sulk over, uh, you know, over over people coming after me, I figured, OK, it, if, if this many people are trying to make this point, do they have a point? Is there a case to be made here? Are we maybe missing something? And I say we like, you know, in the hockey media and just in the hockey world, are we maybe missing something here? And so I ended up writing that piece uh, a week ago now where I, I you know, and, 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 it, and it amuses me a little bit when people say, you know, oh, I didn't like what you wrote or I didn't because I've wrote both sides of the case. I mean, it, literally the format of the article was here's why Islander fans are right, but here's why maybe they're wrong. But here's why maybe they're right. And then here's why. Maybe, and then back and forth like that. So if somebody read that and thought I was attacking the Islanders, they only read half the post. And and I can't. That's on them. That's that's them just looking to be unhappy about something. And, and, and you know, there's nothing I can do about that. But <laughs> it was an interesting exercise to go through because you know it 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 was a case where uh you know I did come out of it feeling like you know what there might be more here than than maybe we're giving credit for and and yeah you know what maybe they're uh you know even though I think the Islanders team purely based on wins and losses based on where they are in the standings based on the stats aren't necessarily the you know a, a top story of this season when you look at what some other teams are doing when you factor in all the context and you factor in not just everything that's happened in the last year but as i say in the piece everything that's happened in the last 25 years and all the crap that islander fans have had to eat for a quarter of a century now i get why in a year where things are actually going well and going better than expected i get why there would be some sensitivity to the idea that okay now after all of that suddenly, you know, the, the hockey world doesn't want to talk about the Islanders anymore when, when things are finally going good. You know, and, and you did make great points within the article in that if it was a Canadian team, you know, we wouldn't be hearing the end of it because it, it always seems like they're the the darlings of the, you know, the media because, face it, you know, Canada is hockey central. It, it is the mecca of the sport, and it's, you know, the, basically the number one up there. Um, so I, I don't really blame <laughs> the media in that sense, but at the same time, you know, as a fan and as someone who's covered the team, it, it just seems like whenever there's an opportunity to jump over the New York Islanders, there are writers that will certainly do that and will certainly use 
that opportunity, you know, to get clicks. And it's unfortunate uh, because on in a year like this year, when they're deserving of praise, you know, and I'm not saying that they're going to contend for a Stanley Cup, but weirder things have happened, right? Um, I, I think an article like yours was good, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, by the way, because you, you presented it coming from both ways, why they could, why they couldn't, you know, and there's a long road here, and Islanders management, Lou Lamorello, uh, Barry Trotz, Lane Lambert, they they have stated on multiple occasions that they're happy with the way that the team is playing, but they keep coming out and they're, they keep saying they're a year or two away from being elite. You know, when you look at what Barry Trotz has done with his previous teams, you could see that this team already is falling into line with what he's been able to accomplish, you know, back then. So, I'm trying not to get too far ahead of myself. I hope, hopefully, my fellow fans are are doing the same. And I think that's pretty much what the premise of your article was. Yeah, and and you know, at at the end of it, it's there. There's different ways you can look at it. If you want to look at it just purely from a hockey perspective and just just wins and losses, the case that I think you could make, and and I'm sure Islander fans are very familiar with the the argument that look, we're we're far enough into this advanced stats era that we know by now that there are certain numbers you can look at that will give you an indication when a team is surprising you uh, as to whether it's it's a surprise that is likely to continue or whether maybe we're seeing a temporary hot streak uh, that is that is unlikely to last over a full season. And, and uh, you know, I'll be really clear, hot streaks, you know, if you, you, you win games during a hot streak, those are still wins. You know, the the, the PDO police don't show up and, and take points off the board when they decide that, you know, you didn't you didn't really deserve them or the percentages said you shouldn't get them. Bank the wins, bank the points, and nobody takes those away from you. They still count. But if we're trying to project ahead what's going to happen in the second half and which team should we be getting excited about in the second half of this season, the Islanders check most of the boxes of a team uh, that seems like it's likely to see a dip in in results, even if they if, if they continue to perform uh, the same as they have now. And the argument against getting excited about the Islanders would be to say, look, look at the numbers, you know, look at some of the stuff that's happened, look at the year they're getting out of Robin Leonard, look at look at some of the the other pieces that were unexpected. This is a team where virtually everything that could go right seems to be going right. They've been they've been healthy for the most part, certainly compared to to a lot of other teams. Uh, they're they're you know they're everything is going just about as well as it could be expected to go in the first half. And yet, this is still a team that is just kind of hanging around the fringe of the wild card race. Maybe a little better. I know every Islanders fan's going to say games in hand. We got a couple games. You do. Uh, you know. So you, you look at look at the percentages it paints a little nicer picture but you've still got a team that is kind of you know uh, uh in in this in this tight fight just to get into a wild card let alone to be something more than that where you know you look at this division and you've got pittsburgh and washington that that are blocking your path out of the division i, I you know i think it's fair to look at this team and say is this have they already reached about this is as good as it's going to get and is this going to be a team uh, where we look back and say, you know, th- this was year one of them hitting the gas and really going somewhere, like you could say for a team like a Toronto, where two years ago they were in the same position, not expected to be good, hanging around the wild card. They end up making the wild card, and and then two years later we look back and say that was the stepping stone. Or is it going to be more like a team like a New Jersey, where last year we're in this position, they make the playoffs, and then they fall right back to the pack where people expected them. And and you know, I don't know what it is. Uh, but I do know that, you know, generally speaking, when people are looking for teams that are going to get a lot of attention, they like to look ahead to those teams that feel like they're going to go two, three rounds deep into the playoffs. And, and the Islanders aren't giving off that vibe necessarily right now, let alone half season in after maybe some of the, some of the bounces and breaks have evened out. Uh, like I said in the piece though, the flip side to that is, okay, that's purely the hockey side. What about the story? What about the narrative? I mean, what kind of underdog story do you want other than the team that sees its franchise player walk away, voluntarily decide he doesn't want to be there anymore? Really, uh, you know, the first franchise player in the history uh, of the NHL in, in the cap era to do that. 
and everybody writes them off and everybody picks them for last place and everybody just just buries them before the season even starts and here they are halfway through the year and they're still fighting and they're still you know they're still holding down that playoff spot they're still beating teams like the lightning um and, and you know what i say in the piece i said if, if the ottawa senators were doing this without eric carlson everybody would be talking about it so why aren't we talking about with the islanders and i'm not completely sure why that is um you know and 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 maybe it is a story that builds some momentum and and you know it's it's one of those things maybe this is the story where all year long we're all going to sit there going it can't last and it can't last and it can't last and then you get to the final week of the season and you go oh crap it it did last and and now they're into the playoffs and once they get there i mean who knows you know, and I, I mentioned to Arthur Staple that I was going to have you on, and, and he said, good for you for, for facing the music, so to speak. Um, but I had him on a couple weeks back, and we talked about uh, similar things in the playoffs and, and some of the storylines that are hanging out there that he could potentially be writing about, you know, in a couple of months' time. And wouldn't it be something if, and I'm not saying that this is, inherently possible i mean but anything is possible in the nhl right so wouldn't it be something if the islanders wind up facing off against toronto in the first round of the playoffs and then doing damage potentially even eliminating them wouldn't that be kind of like a funny storyline given everything that's happened over the last couple of months i mean that that would be phenomenal that that would be you know it's 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 unlikely to happen only because i don't think the leafs are 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 going to be able to to get within uh, range of the Lightning, uh, which which means Toronto would be uh, playing a playing a division drive. But somebody raised this to me, and I, I love the idea. They said that uh, the the Islanders playoff run it's going to be the the revenge tour. Uh, it's going to start in Washington, yeah, Barry Trotz's old team, uh, Pittsburgh. We know all the history there. Then you get Toronto in the conference final, so you get to knock out John Tavares, and then you face Nashville in the final. Trotz's original team, uh, and and it just becomes the uh, the full on. Uh, the full-on four-round revenge tour, uh, and and it, it it just 25 years of of misery and and agony and all of that just just vanishes in one playoff round. I mean, if you're gonna uh, if if you're gonna do it up, hockey gods might as well do it right. Let's let's uh, give us give us that path. You know, that seems like the type of uh, storyline that you know spawns books and movies. And uh, I know a guy. I think I'm speaking to him right now that could potentially write that book. Yeah, I think the the guy you're thinking of is uh, has is kind of all booked out for uh, for a little while. So you you might want to might need to give me a couple years on it. Maybe uh, maybe I'll, I'll let Staples take that one. <laughs> so how has the reaction been uh, in the comment section of uh, the Athletic for this article and and uh, the reaction on Twitter? Are you getting hammered? Is it a, a positive reaction? I, I know some of the people that. Um, were tweeting at me today when I put out that, you know, I, I wanted to hear some questions uh, for you. We're kind of all over the place. So I'm sure that's kind of the same reaction for you. Yeah, I mean, it was it was mostly good, actually. It was, uh, you know, I think even even Islander fans who didn't, you know, like I said, if you sit down and read the piece, you're going to whatever side you fall on, you're going to see some stuff you agree with and some you don't, because this 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 wasn't me really bravely planting a flag in the ground this this was me sort of more walking my own way through through an issue i was trying to get my head around so uh you know for the most part people people seem to appreciate that and and uh you know there there was uh, i would say the feedback was mostly positive uh since then uh you know there there have been you know like i when i had my power rankings out again today and you know again people well you know the islanders this and that and it's you know okay i mean it's it this isn't you know, none of this is assigned reading. It's it's not you know it's not homework. I can't force you to sit down and plow through twenty five hundred words. And and certainly on Twitter, I I know there are people who uh, it it's very clear to me are reacting to the idea of the article and the idea in their head of of what they think it says without having actually read it. But that's fine. I mean, the the, the athletics a paywall site. I understand that not everyone who sees the link get tweeted out is is going to actually be able to read it, let alone. Uh, take the time to do it. So, I mean, that's that's life. I, I will say that I, you know, Islander fans have certainly been have certainly been passionate, uh, and and I appreciate that. I I've never one thing you will never hear me say to to any fan base or any fan that I'm that I'm arguing with is uh, is is to calm down or to you know relax. Don't take it so serious. It's just a game. Uh, I, I never say that because I know what it's like to be a fan. I know what it's like to take this too seriously. And I know that if everybody took this sport as seriously as it deserves to be taken, 
the the league probably wouldn't exist and people like me definitely wouldn't have jobs writing about it so i you know i i don't mind that there there are always going to be the occasional um dummies that that kind of um uh, can, can, can ruin the experience for everyone. But I don't think that you don't paint a whole fan base with the brush of the worst of them. And, and I say that as a Toronto Maple Leaf fan, I, I, I know very well how, how frustrating it is to have like the, the, the 5% that are dummies held up as representing everyone. And so I'm, you know, I'm not going to turn around and do that to another fan base. Now I know you, you got to get going here shortly. So we'll close with, what do you think the Islanders need to do here moving forward, um, sustainability-wise or, or maybe even personnel-wise, you know, in order to keep trending in, in the upwards direction here? Do, do they add somebody on the power play? Because I've said numerous times here the power play has been the biggest issue for me because it's going to cost you points, uh, and it has here over the last uh, couple of games. So do they add at some point? somebody who could be a threat you know if if they're not going to score you know maybe they will draw the opposition to them to open up a little bit of room for the other players on the ice uh do they add maybe a depth defenseman do they go after Bobrovsky or you think they re-sign Robin Leonard uh I mean I I certainly would expect that they will they will make an effort to re-sign Robin Leonard and I, I think that is, is going to be I mean that that's the starting point not necessarily chronologically because you know the, obviously the players have control there too but I, th- I think uh, you know when you look at his his story and and sort of you know what he's been through in his career and and some of the uh, the things that he shared uh, with with the with the world earlier in the season I, I think this has been a good fit I, I it, from the outside it certainly looks that way I, I certainly don't claim to be any kind of insider where uh, uh, you know I I, I have uh, uh, you know, I have any uh, uh, views that other people can't see, but uh, I, I do. It, it feels like a good fit. It feels like he has been treated well by this organization. He's certainly held up his end of the bargain uh, in terms of what he's done on the ice. This feels like a good fit going forward. Um, you know, as far as bringing someone in, it's it's interesting because because the tough thing when you're in this situation, when you're when you're kind of a playoff bubble team, it does get interesting around the deadline because the question becomes, what do we do? Do we bring in reinforcements? Do we try to get in right now? Uh, if so, you know, who do we bring in that's going to actually move the needle on our odds? And even if we do get in, what are the chances that we can we can do something once we get there? And what is the value in maybe giving up future picks and prospects for a guy who might help us make the playoffs, and then we lose in five games to Washington or Tampa or whoever it is? Uh, and you know, I, I, I will say that I I do think there is some value in that in in just just getting in and just having a shot. I'm not one of these people who thinks that, you know, every year there's one team that wins the cup and everyone else has failed and everyone else should look at the season as, uh, as, as, as some sort of failure. I think that's a miserable way to go through life as a, as a hockey fan, uh, to think that only 3% of us get to be happy every year, uh, you know, getting into the playoffs and, and having a bit of a run potentially has some value, even if it doesn't ultimately end in a Stanley cup. So I don't think you have to be a Stanley cup favorite to go out and, and, and make moves at the deadline, but you do have to balance it. You know, th- this is a young team that, uh, you know, this is a, an organization that's in that sort of building phase and, and they do have some real nice young pieces. Uh, you know, you presumably are going to hold on to those, but you know, is, is it enough? Do you need the, you know, how, how many of the picks can you give up? And what's going to be interesting is you look at that, that bubble this year, you've got sort of of the, of the four teams now that that i would that that seem to be right in that wild card bubble which is the islanders montreal buffalo carolina of those teams you've got the islanders buffalo and carolina certainly you know haven't been in the playoffs in a while and 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 haven't done damage in the playoffs and gone on a deep run in 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 quite a while and probably all of them would be very anxious to to land there And, and and that can potentially create an interesting scenario where, where you start seeing some bidding wars around certain guys. And it's, it's, you know, we've been told that it should be a, a buyer's market this year. There's quite a few teams that are out of the running and, and are looking to sell. Um, so it, it's, it's going to be kind of fascinating to me to see, you know, what, what is it that the Islanders want to do? Uh, and then what is it that they might decide they have to do if a Buffalo or a Carolina or maybe a Montreal, although I, th- I think they will be less of a player, uh, suddenly gets real aggressive and, and suddenly you got those fans going, hey, wait a second, how come these guys are loading up? What about us? What do we do? It's it's going to be 
uh, it, it's going to be an interesting situation. And this is one of those things where I, it's probably, uh, you know, makes you sleep a little better at night to have Lou Lamarillo there, a guy who's been through this, uh, you know, who knows how many times, uh, and, and, you know, you would hope is, has got a steady hand and is, is going to, uh, uh, is, is going to kind of do the cold and calculated thing and figure out what's best for the, for the franchise, not just now, but in the long term. Uh, and, uh, and that he's going to, he's going to make sure that that's what gets done, uh, and doesn't necessarily chase that, that short term goal, uh, unless he feels like, unless he feels like it's worth doing that. Now, do you, do you feel the Islanders, obviously the, the negativity around everything and, and, you know, you, you closed out your article with a myriad of reasons, uh, <laughs> why fans might be wrong with, with all of, like the weird things that have happened to this organization. Do you think now we're beyond whatever negativity has happened in the past? And you, do you feel, you know, they'll be viewed upon as, as a real player here moving forward, because that's, that's the whole point of bringing Lou Lamorello and Barry Trotz in to, to show that the team is now a big boy team. It's not the same country club that it's been in the past and they're going to demand respect here, at least for me, you know, in the coming years. Yeah, I, I mean, you would you would certainly hope so. It's it's interesting to me, obviously, being a Maple Leafs fan. I, I got to uh, watch Lou Lamarillo do his work, uh, you know, up, up close for the last few years, and and with some mixed results, to be real honest with you. I mean, uh, you know, this is a guy who, uh, you know, his his resume uh, in New Jersey speaks for itself. But his last few years in New Jersey were. Not as successful. His his time in Toronto was was a little bit hit and miss. Uh, definitely, you know, with with some definite hits in there that uh, that made that team a lot better. But uh, you know, you you, you kind of want to see, uh, you know, the the game is changing so much. Is he going to be able to embrace that, or is he going to be stuck in his ways and and be that guy who's a little too old school? Uh, but I think he's a really bright guy. I, I you know, I'm I'm not necessarily concerned if if I'm an Islanders fan there. And then Barry Trotz is, I mean, he's one of the best coaches in the entire game, hands down. Uh, so you're in good hands there. You know, when, when I went down that laundry list of, of problems and issues and, you know, everything that that's kind of haunted the Islanders over the years, a lot of that is in the past because, you know, a lot of it involves people who aren't there anymore. Uh, you know, we, we can all make our jokes and, and look, I think a lot of the jokes were, were justified. And I think a lot of the criticism was justified. And I think a lot of it was very fair uh, as, as unpleasant as it probably was for Islander fans to hear uh, you know, I, I think a lot of it was really legitimate, but you know, you, you can make your Mike Milbury jokes, but Mike Milbury's not there anymore. And, you know, you can make your, make your jokes about past ownership groups. They're not there anymore. And it's, it's, you know, it's at the heart of everything for the last 20, 30 years for this team, it's been ownership and it's been the arena. And it finally looks like both of those things are, uh, have been addressed and, and are, are on solid ground going forward. Uh, and you know, that's, that's really the key that, that gives you that stability from, from the top down. Believe me, I, you know, sitting here in Ottawa, uh, nobody, nobody knows better than the, the hockey fans here, uh, the importance of ownership and, and stability and the Islanders have that finally. And, and certainly they've got, they've got some of the pieces in place to be a real good team going forward. I don't think they have all the pieces. Uh, I, I don't know that. Any team ever feels confident that they have all the pieces. Sometimes you gotta you gotta luck into a few things. You gotta uh, you gotta have a few guys uh, turn out to be uh, better pieces than what you thought they were. But it, they're they're headed in the right direction. You know the the trends are all good. Um, there there's lots of reason for optimism here. There have been lots of teams in the past we could have said that about that that never got there or that derailed uh, before uh, before they really saw those efforts bear fruit. That could happen to the Islanders. They're, they're, this is a crazy league. They're, they're, everything's unpredictable. Everything, you know, they're, they're, we, we never seem to completely know what's going on. So I think anyone who, who wants to sit there and say the Islanders are guaranteed to do this or that is is selling you a bill of goods. Uh, they, they, there's a lot of uncertainty around where this team is headed for me uh, right now. But the good news is that uncertainty is just around regular on the ice hockey stuff for a change. And it's not about ownership or the GM or the backup goalie who is now the GM or whether this guy should be the coach or whatever it is. It's, it's finally just around the pieces on the roster. Do they have the right guys? Uh, you know, do they, do they have enough coming through the pipeline to, to supplement it and how far can they go? 
And it's nice to be doing that. It's nice to be talking about the Islanders finally just as a hockey team uh, and not as a sideshow. And and hopefully, fingers crossed, those days are behind us. Uh, and uh, if they are, I promise you, Islander fans are going to start getting that, that coverage and that attention that they're looking for, uh, even if it's coming a little slower than they might want. Yeah, the, the future definitely looks bright with the likes of Barzell and Taves and some of the kids that they have down in Bridgeport here. And, you know, uh, I, I think that they're certainly trending in the right direction. And I, and I don't believe, you know, like they're completely done here. There's still a lot of work to be done, as I've mentioned previously. And I'm content with riding this wherever it takes us and getting the experience if they do happen to sneak into the playoffs. Maybe they do some damage, but either way. You got the young guys on the team that are going to benefit from the learning experience of the playoffs. And you have these veteran guys like Leo Komarov and Valtteri Filppula who are going to show them how to be a vet in those situations, which is, which is a positive thing as well. So, Sean, thank you. I know you got to run. Uh, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and talking about this and putting on your shin guards. <laughs> Why don't you... Uh, <laughs> Why don't you give us uh, a rundown of where everybody can find your stuff and how they can reach out to you on Twitter and, and everywhere else? Yeah, I mean, you can follow me on Twitter uh, or, or come yell at me on Twitter at, uh, at Down Goes Brown. Uh, you can find me at uh, The Athletic uh, if, if you uh, are a subscriber. And if you are not a subscriber, uh, please consider su- subscribing because it's only a couple of bucks a month. And, and like I say, it really is a kind of an uh, all-star roster of uh, – uh, of writers, not just in hockey, but across across all the sports that uh, that you follow. Uh, and I also have a uh, a book out uh, that you'd mentioned, the uh, Down Goes Brown History of the NHL, and and obviously that uh, that is a uh, a book where the the Islanders feature fairly heavily once you get to the late 70s and and into the 80s. So uh, I, I hope uh, people will check that out. You can get that on Amazon or wherever else you you buy your books. It's it's hardcover. You can get the ebook. You can even get an audio book and and listen to me read it to you for for eight or nine hours. Uh, and beyond that, uh, yeah, that that's it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, having the chance to come on and uh, talk to all my new friends uh, in in Islander land. Uh, and uh, I, I appreciate it sincerely. And uh, I think uh, Darcy Tucker got a raw deal, and it was a, a fairly clean hit. <laughs> Don't make me get Mark, because I'll just call Mark right now, and, and he'll jump right on, and he might have to fight you himself. <laughs> I felt I was getting too I was getting too positive there, so I figure I gotta yeah, yeah I can't I, I can't uh, I gotta I gotta I gotta have one one more quick heel turn before I go. And you know, Islander fans that are listening, the nicer you are to Sean, the more positive he will write about the New York Islanders, because he said that himself right there in that article on the Athletic that you're gonna read as soon as you're done listening to this. Yeah, exactly. You got to be nice. I'm, I'm Canadian, man. You got to uh, you, you got to you got to be nice to us, or else. Uh, well, I mean, well, we we apologize. That's what we do when people aren't nice to us. But we'll we'll, we'll do it angrily. You need to put a couple of uh, loonies or toonies in the sorry jar now, man. Exactly. Hook me up. <laughs> All right. Thanks for joining me, man. Thank you. So overall, we had a great weekend, right? Other than the game against the New York Rangers, where the Islanders seem to be chasing them around all too much. Uh, they had maybe a good period, definitely better than the previous game against the Rangers on Thursday, but power play got to do something about that power play only had one against Tampa on Sunday, but they were one for one. Uh, they kept Tampa off the score sheet on their power play on all three of their chances. So that was a positive. Barzell looked great. Beauvillier looked great. I said that name right for all you people who keep pointing out that I reverse the V and the L. Beauvillier. So he looked good. Taves, unbelievable. Another goal. Kid is just making his case to never be out of the lineup again. And I I posted on Twitter earlier today, I didn't realize or at least not remember uh, that Devon Taves was drafted in 2014 with the pick acquired from the Philadelphia Flyers in the Mark Streit deal with the New York Islanders. So that little situation there is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, Mark Streit was a great New York Islander, great captain prior to John Tavares. 
He was another one of those guys that I loved talking to in the locker room. He would just sit and he would talk to you for as long as you wanted. He didn't really care. He was always accommodating. But yeah, so great drafting there. And I know a lot of people don't want to admit that either by Garth Snow with that pick or at least, you know, his staff at that draft. But going back to the games this weekend, I I didn't really think that the Islanders were going to get the two points on Sunday. I, I thought it would have been the other way around. Not necessarily thinking that the Rangers were an automatic win, but it looked like Tampa maybe thought they were going to have an automatic win against the Islanders the way that they played. Now, you could argue, and I I mentioned this with Sean earlier in this episode, that maybe you could make a case for the Islanders having a little better legs, uh, but the Islanders played the same three games in four nights as Tampa with a little less travel and a little less turnaround because they were in Buffalo for the late game on Saturday night. But still, 12 hours turnaround, 24 hours rather, and it is what it is. We got a big statement win. Hopefully the Islanders can build on it, take what they've learned, and move on here as we face St. Louis later on this week. So, again... Big thanks to Sean for joining me this week on episode 20 of the Isles Faithful podcast. I am your host, Michael Sherline. You could follow me on Twitter at Isles Blogger at Faithful Isles. The website is theislesfaithful.com, Instagram, Facebook. We got everything, all the socials. Do us a favor, rate, review, subscribe on iTunes. It would help us out. We're also available on Podbean, Stitcher, Google, uh, Spotify, pretty much everywhere you can listen to a podcast. We're there. If we're not on your favorite podcast app or website, let me know and I will do my best to get on there ASAP. So we will speak to you later on this week after the St. Louis game. Maybe we will have our third podcast in the matter of seven days. Thanks for listening. Let's go Islanders. Islanders.